Welcome everybody back to season four of the Undisrupted Podcast. Adam, how are we doing? We are doing splintiferous. Splintiferous. Look it up, peoples. It's in the internet. We're excited to be back. And we have with you a special edition. This is called the Pardon the Disruption opening show. And we're going to get right started with it. So those of you that missed this, we did a Future Ready Tech Leaders Summit recently where we were able to debut this kind of format. Uh, Hard-hitting, quick, quick-hitting analysis fashioned after a show uh, made after a network that has four letters starting with E and ending with N. We won't say anything else other than that. But they inspired us, as we see a lot of times in education, to mimic this. So let's talk about the disruption. First of all, the past 18 months, Adam, what have we been doing here? We've been trying to survive. We've been trying to make it from the AM to the PM. And just when we thought we were over it, it comes right back and puts us back where we were. That is where we are right now. We're trying to figure out, and I hate the term, but we all keep using it, the new normal. New normal. Because yep. we're not post-COVID. We are, if you want to say post-COVID, we, I say post when it came here. <laughs> yeah. We're still in the middle of all this. Yeah, it is not going away anytime soon. My my kids have, uh, I still have two of mine at home. I mean, this is like their their last full year. They told me that this morning, their last full year in school was 2018-19 um, when they were in kinder and first grade. They're now in third and fourth. So that's a lot to go on. But you know what? Over the last few months, we've done some things right. Um, so what would you say are some things that we've done right uh, as as it pertains to the disruption that we've experienced? One thing that I can say that we've done right, we've put our money where our mouth is like we have definitely found the resources at the federal level to kind of start getting some of these things right so putting money in the hands of districts and getting rid of some of the constraints that we've had i know e-rate does a great job of giving districts money for connectivity but there's a lot of strings attached to that we've had like title one money to buy stuff but then there's strings attached to that but right now i think with this connectivity and different with the esser with the um ECF Ursa, funding, the ARSA, they're getting the that ARPA, right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Like, yes. All the letters. <laughs> they are. <laughs> Let's throw them in there and see what happens. Well, it's the alphabet soup. Yeah, we're figuring it out. Yeah, I think you're right. I think there was some money. I mean, I think we think about uh, E-rate, it was like $7 billion a year is what we get for that. And compare that to the $200 billion that we're getting for ESSER. And we talked about this a lot last season. But I mean, it's finally, I feel like we're getting some funds to, to mm -hmm. overcome those gaps, to get that connectivity and access to kids. Uh, if only we could order the supplies and they would get here in time. That's a whole nother question because I'm here now, boys and girls. If you want that new Xbox or whatever it is, you better order it today because it ain't coming. Uh, if you order, you wait till the last couple of weeks of Black Friday, it ain't coming because I'm not hearing all those supply lines are way, way behind. Yes, everything. Wood, glass, plastic. Uh, I, I tried to go to Chipotle today. They were out of black beans. They said there's a shortage on black beans. I'm like, what? <laughs> How can it be out of black beans? So we have done a lot of things wrong. So let's, let's uh, besides the supply and demand yeah. and supply chain part of it, what do you think uh, uh, for you are some of the some of the things we've done wrong during the pandemic? Right now, the, the, the thing that really is grinding my gears that we're getting wrong is the missed opportunity. We had a chance to recalibrate, to change fundamentally, people hate hearing that, fundamentally change education to really help the students that the system was not designed to help. And we're, we're getting that wrong. We're trying to go back to the way things used to be. Even in some of the classrooms, teachers are uh, going back to a lot of the bad educational practices, copying notes off the boards uh, because, you know, it's, it's yes, people still need to write things, but not that way. Right. Not like that. Not like that. Not like this. Yeah, hours and hours of homework. Let's bring it all back, right? Now that they're now that they're back in class, and not all of them are, admittedly, but um, yeah, let's go ahead and go back to those old practices. That's why I think, and I don't, I, I think we've gotten it wrong, but I, I'm also going to give us some some leeway and a little bit of runway here to make some changes still, because we are still, like you said earlier, we're still in it, and so my hope is, yeah, that when we're finally, finally out of it. Some teacher out there, and a lot of teachers out there are going to take a deep breath or tech leaders or superintendents, they're going to say, ah, we did this right. We did this wrong. Let's continue this best practice. Let's get rid of that bad practice. Because yeah, when it comes to connectivity, sure, we threw a bunch of devices and, and access points in the hands of kids, but is it really being done that well? I mean, uh, did we change any type of instructional curriculum practices? No, I don't think so. Right. And even when you look at all the uh, virtual schools that people are spinning up out the blue, I, I wonder, are we really thinking about what's best for kids or are we checking a box to put something in place? 
uh, our, our district's really sharing those practices to make sure everyone is providing that high quality education that all students deserve. I don't know if that's what we're doing. I, I think we're trying, but I don't know if we're getting it right. We may be getting it left. I think you're right. <laughs> and you also just inspired my new fantasy football team name. I'm going to be the technology box checkers because I feel like that is what we do in technology a lot of times. We check those boxes. But, oh, got a little bell ring because we're going to go to the rundown. Now, these are hard-hitting challenges coming at you one minute, two minutes at a time. Those of you that are listening, you're going to have to kind of play along with us as you listen to our words. But those of you watching on the YouTube video, you will be able to see, of course, our rundown script here as we start with TikTok challenges, Adam. They're kind of crazy. They're going everywhere. As of this uh, last couple of weeks, the new one is slapping teachers and then recording it. What are your thoughts on, <laughs> on the TikTok and the challenges they keep throwing up at you? <laughs> you know, we needed a, a challenge. I think somebody was saying, you know, buy an educator a cup of coffee. Yeah. Um, <laughs> or a bottle of booze. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, we, we got to come up with some good challenges here. But, you know, one thing we have to be careful with some of these TikTok challenges, just like if those remember a couple of years ago, the Momo challenge. Yes. You got to make sure that we don't turn these things into reality. So I think sometimes these things are just floated out there. And if we, us uh, old farts start like <laughs> believing it, then it actually will happen. Like a kid's like, you know what? I do want to slap somebody. Thank yeah. you uh, for telling me that this is a thing. So it's almost like a troll. You know, if we feed it, then it will gain its own life. So like stop Ooh. feeding these things. Just, you know, kind of ignore it. It'll go away. Stop feeding the troll. Yeah. Instantly, I saw letters spun out by the school districts across America saying, watch out for this. Beware of this challenge. And when you do, you shed light on it, which then, of course, like you said, gives it energy. Good point there. But uh, let's shift to something a little more educational. The idea of e-libraries. You and I have talked about this for a couple of years now. Uh, what are the what are the goods, the bads of, of e-libraries? Because I feel like they had to shift a lot, of course, also during the pandemic. So what do you see as a bonus out of this? Well, like the, the amazing thing that I found with this, we're in a day and age where we don't want to touch anything. I don't want to touch your money. I don't want to touch <laughs> you. I, I, you know, but with e-libraries, it gives us the opportunity to still get literature in front of the hands of our students. I know what we had to do when we initially shut down, when it was supposed to be two weeks, we wanted every kid to walk out of our schools with a book. So we didn't get a lot of those books back. And that is a problem now, not to say that we have to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but we do need to increase our digital libraries. We want to make sure more e-prints in the hands of those kids because also our high stakes assessments that these kids are doing, they're on computer screens. It takes a different quote unquote muscle to read on screen, to read and take notes off of digital content. So the kids need more practice with that. So we need a more robust collection and we need to push these publishers to make it easier. Yeah. And I think that I think that's something that's dismissed a lot of times because these publishers are they're publishers. They're not programmers. And so a lot of times what they present to you is a PDF version, which isn't what we should have out there. I mean, honestly, there's so much uh, opportunity for adaptability. I think about my own daughter who we change and convert some of the text of her books to open dyslexic font. So she has the heavily weighted letters. It helps her read. Um, I think about how you can expand the screen or ex ex increase the font. I mean, just some of the opportunities out there. I don't think that means we have to throw away the, the traditional books. Because for me, when, I come to, when it comes to long-term reading, I'm still a big fan of like, you know, I, I've got my Stephen King book right now that I'm in the middle of, and I'm like reading that thing long form, and it's a it's a paper book, unlimited battery life. I love it. Um, <laughs> but uh, but when you think about the the ebooks and e libraries, there is some research out there that shows that you know short term or little or like you're saying, it's a different muscle. You have to train that muscle, and if we don't have that as an opportunity or an offering in our schools, then we're missing the boat for those kids for sure. And also Audible books too. You gotta add some of those. I know. You see, you always forget about the Audible too. I mean, that's another thing. I've just started getting yeah. into that. Finally, like road trips, uh, mowing the grass. I mean, listening to the new Game of Thrones book. I mean, I, that's how I read Fire and Blood. Was just I read it, quote unquote, by having some guy read it to me. Uh, but let's let's get serious now. Let's shift for a minute here. Let's. And for those of you that aren't playing along, you're gonna have to figure this out on the screen if you're just listening to us. But we're gonna talk about CRT yeah. in schools because I think uh, you know, Adam, uh, I, I hate it. You do really. Hated it. Yeah, I'm, here, here's the thing. We are in a day and age in 2021. We got to move beyond CRT. That's that's something that it had a time and it had a place in education. It doesn't now. You know, you know, it's, it's a shame it's in some corner of some schools right. right now. But you know what? We need to get rid of it. Get No more CRT. We can't have it. I mean, my kids are growing up in the 21st century. We got to get rid of it. Well, you know, and it's funny because I feel like some people just want to just forget about it and just push it in the corner and say, you know what, that's not a part of our history. But the truth is, 
CRTs are a part of our history, especially with technology. When you talk about cathode ray tube, uh, those those cathode ray tube monitors, I mean, I know LEDs are the next big thing, but CRT to me, I mean, we should recognize it, acknowledge it, and then understand it so we can be better in our future and don't make the same mistakes twice. Don't you don't you agree? I you know, yeah, I, I do agree with you on that one. You, you know, definitely, you know, those cathode ray tubes, get rid of them. You know, it's time, you know, ULED, something. You, you got to move, got to move forward. Got to move forward. We're, we got to get more high tech here. Get rid of those CRTs in school. There, you heard it here first, folks. That's right. Well, not here first. Unfortunately, a lot of other people are talking about getting rid of CRT, <laughs> but a different kind of CRT. Uh, okay, speaking of that different kind of CRT, let's talk a little bit about equity and access. So we talked about it at the outset of the show. There's already a lot of push out there to get to get these access points, to get technology in the hands of kids. Um, are, are we are we raising, rising to the challenge, do you feel like? Are we there yet? Or, or, or are we still struggling in some areas? No, and it, it, the thing that I look at it, and I, I always say this, I break it down to three letters, ACT, ACT, um, Access, Connectivity, and Task. And I think we're falling short on those. When I say access, I mean, we're hitting, we're kind of hitting the A right now. We're giving students access to devices, if that's what we're talking about, access to technology. But here's where we're missing that mark. Are we giving them access to the right tool that they need? Because, you know, we all know this. We've done this. One to one, we give every kid the exact same exact device, same. except that they have an IEP. Other than yeah. that, we're giving every kid a Chromebook, or every kid an iPad, every kid a, a MacBook Air or whatever it is versus what they need. And then the connectivity piece, that's the C part. Do they have connectivity, a high speed connectivity outside of school, outside of school? Because now you have to use your cell phone to contact the doctor when you want an appointment. And, and the, the last piece that is the task. Are we looking at the task? Are we giving certain tasks to certain students? Very often we see the expectations are low for our students in poverty, our students of color. So the tasks that they're asked to do on technology are very low level. They're not getting those higher reasoning skills. They're not gonna be ready to do all this coding, building, creating jobs that are gonna be out there. So that's where I think we're kind of falling short on that ACT piece. Yeah, the digital divide is going away. It's turning into an instructional and curricular divide. And I think you're right on point with that last point there, which is, yeah, history has shown us that in those lower economic and those underserved communities, they are getting more of the repetitive tasks when it comes to being on a computer and just doing really simple, low level things to kind of catch them up, so to speak, on the math and reading scores mm -hmm. versus the higher socioeconomic uh, schools, which of course have higher reading scores and higher math scores just because of where they live. Um, and we're giving them all the innovative, creative stuff to let them go off and be amazing entrepreneurs, but everyone should have that opportunity. And I think that's gonna be the next big challenge in schools now that we're starting to finally overcome the equity and access thing. Because we need that money, man. And when you talk about money, uh, what is going on with these billionaires? Um, what's that show that used to be on? Uh, it was on the, the Muppet Show, um, Pigs in Space. Now what is it? <laughs> yeah. Billionaires. Yeah, yeah. Billionaires in, in space, 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 space. space. Yeah. You know, it is so crazy that you have so much money. This is the biggest, like, stunting uh flossing that you and i don't mean the dance i mean you know you just want to show what you got you know we talked about bling bling you know yeah. let me show you all the diamonds and jewels that i have no 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 forget all that i want to build something and go away from you in outer space i mean that is the biggest baller move ever <laughs> i'm still waiting for one of them to just invent like the death star and just float around on it right <laughs> i feel like that's the next big thing for one of these billionaires yes and you have a theory about elon musk What's your theory about Elon yeah, Musk? Yeah, I mean, I really think, I mean, Elon Musk is a James Bond villain. I mean, you, you've heard it here first. Yep. He is a James Bond villain. We are going to find out that all this stuff is really planning to take over the world with some kind of like diamond cutting laser that he's going to build in outer space. I've seen this in the movie, Space Raker or something like Moon Raker. Like it's, it's one of those things. <laughs> Watch out for Jaws. Yeah. Yeah. All those space satellites that he's putting up there to give us internet. Oh, it's all a big ploy, right? You heard it here, folks, guys. Yeah, that was guys. in that one movie. Uh, the, the 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 movie with Samuel L. Jackson in it, and the the guy was like uh, the snakes on a plane. The the gentleman, yeah. No. <laughs> why you guys is that know the, what I'm talking about? Why is that the first Sam Jackson movie I think of when you say Sam Jackson? I was like, oh, it could have been Jurassic Park. It could have been uh, only the Avengers, but no, I go straight to snakes on a plane. That's no, depressing. Snakes on a plane. <laughs> we got to get these snakes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> 
What about, okay, so we, we hit a little bit about this ESSER funds too. So ESSER funding is coming in. Um, a lot of us have now seen our, low, our, our phase one and phase two, and now we're hitting our phase three, which is kind of the really big bucket that's coming in. We've got that cliff that's coming in 2024. Um, thoughts, concerns, uh, are you starting to spend it? Are you seeing other districts starting to spend it? And how are they spending it? Spent. It's already, we've already spent that money. It's, spent. Like, <laughs> it's not spending. It's spent. It, it is spent it in. You know, but here's my biggest problem with, I mean, I, I appreciate the funding, but here's the biggest thing that's, that I want people to realize this ESSER funding is really just getting schools caught up with where we should have been because most school systems, most states have had dollars that have been reduced since the recession. So the money that we're getting is a total, is an influx of cash. We're happy we have this money, but this is money really that was already owed to us that we weren't receiving way back when Bush left office when the recession was hitting. So you go back, you know, three uh, presidential terms, you know, and, and count those dollars we missed. This is kind of what we're getting now. And the problem is now that we got this money, we need to come up with ways so we can keep getting this kind of money to keep schools going. We should use the money to figure out how we can get more money, right? We should we should yes. pocket some of that and put it into lobbyists to figure out how to do it. <laughs> I mean, because otherwise I, I kind of flinched when I saw the price tag. I was excited, but also scared thinking, man, you know, we're going to go buy a bunch of the next widget and throw it into schools and forget about professional development, forget about culture building, forget about all the things that really make technology programs successful that you and I know from our decades of doing it. And it's just going to be like, here we go. We got a couple of years to do it. Let's spend it all. Or as you said, it's already spent. Um, so I, yeah, I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, but I'm still right. a little concerned. But, you know, we, somebody said this, I think it was Sarah Thomas mentioned this in our, in our session that we also got to look at implicit bias training with some of this yes. money, because going back to the point that I mentioned about equity and access, it goes back to those expectations those teachers have of their students. And if there's low expectations that bias is there, then we're not going to get that academic achievement that we want from some of these dollars that are spent because low expectations, you're going to get low results from those students. So we got to look at the whole child, the whole picture, the SEL piece, and also these biases that teachers also, and, and, and administrators tech directors, everybody bring into their job. I mean, we're regular people, we have our biases. So we have to really look at and examine those to get us where we need to be. Yeah, and if you look guys at the at the lettering of the law, when you talk about what those funds can be used for, there is funding in place for SEL, for a lot of the things that we're talking about. So you could have training that would actually address those biases or biases as you were uh, to help us overcome those Which things. Which one is it? Is it bias, biases, biases? Uh, I think, it, I think I it's bias, or is it like deer? Is it like bias is just plural in general, like bias. Look, there goes a whole bunch of bias. No, I think it's biases, <laughs> biases. Sorry, folks. All right, we're, we're off the rails here. Let's talk about something a little more serious now. Uh, you know what? We had a serious moment in America about two or three days ago when we are recording yes. this podcast. This is in early October, folks. But, tragedy. Uh, yeah, tragedy. For two to three hours, Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp all went down. How did? What did you do with all your extra time you had, Adam? What's, what's that? What one was that? What's that? What's that? <laughs> no, it, it reminded me of, you remember that uh, that Apple commercial where the guy, that intern pulled the plug on the apps and everybody's apps started deleting off their phone and then yeah. like somebody was walking around like, you know, like, like my picture, like my picture. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's what it was like. It's like people didn't know what to do with themselves. It's like I posted something. I don't know if people are liking it. I, you know, I thought it was one thing that had me dying. A guy was like, I had to go next door to show people my dinner so they could like it. That's awesome. <laughs> like actually take the dinner, go next door. I can only imagine what it did for uh, the, the virus and for all the vaccine people out there, too. Because did you say was it Fallon or was it Kimmel or somebody who had something about? Yeah, it got Kimmel. Yeah. <laughs> That when everybody got vaccinated, all of a sudden in those hours that uh, Facebook was down. Right. Yeah, it was the first time in a long time that I hadn't seen anything about a school board meeting gone awry. You know, it's bad when that makes the top of SNL, too, which was on last week. That was a hilarious bit, but also <laughs> kind of sad. All right. Well, a couple more things here, folks, as we wrap up here, a little bit more about sustainability, because another thing is Adam mentioned earlier, we're talking about these funds. We're talking about this cliff. We're talking about how we've already spent the money. How do we continue to get that money? But even if we can't get that money, are there ideas or strategies where we can sustain? What are your thoughts on that? I mean, there always are ideas, and that's one of the things. I know we're going to talk about this coming up, but we want to make sure we hit on this this season, talking about ways we can sustain that. I know you have, like Digital Promise has a really great resource that they pushed out. We'll add in the, in the description of this podcast. Uh, there's a lot of great resources out there about sustaining what you've already purchased, but future ready. 
that's 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 where we want people to go to looking at that wheel we're going to be doing a lot of uh virtual events to make sure that people have the tools in their hands to understand now that you got this stuff what are all the costs that go along with it because i think that is the part that some districts are missing they don't have that full picture understanding of yeah you just spent three million dollars on devices but what comes next yeah, that gift with a tail. We just got a puppy, and it let me tell you, it tears, it's tearing everything apart. The costs, the puppy costs this amount. The amount of training and everything else we're going to need for it is going to cost uh, ten tenfold. I think it's the same thing with devices. And we had Rob Dixon, former uh, former guest on the, one of our previous seasons, of course, was in that virtual summit with us, and he talked a lot about zero cost kind of balancing, like looking at you know, what are some things that we can kind of eliminate? Maybe there's some programs that just aren't being used anymore. We are victim and I've victim yeah. of this at home personally because I've got like Paramount Plus and Prime and Hulu and everything. Like, okay, some of these I don't even use anymore, but every month they get renewed, right? Maybe we need to start thinking they about- They get you on that 30-day trial. You get that free 30-day yeah. trial. Oh, I forgot to cancel. I need to put the calendar in my <laughs> reminder. That's right. Um, it's crazy. Like all this stuff. We do that personally. And we can only imagine what a school district sometimes will do that with program. We're like, you know, it, it was a need that we needed prior to COVID and we just kind of kept it around because we weren't sure. But maybe it's time to really start to evaluate that and think about how can we get a little more lean so we can stretch our dollars farther. Like like paper, like all the printing, like uh, let, let, let's scale back some of the printing that we're doing. That yeah. that may save us some money right there. Yeah. Maybe, Going back to we're talking about with ebooks and digital text. I mean, let's look at some of these other things. Maybe that'll be the ultimate. If well, assuming we don't go back to normal, maybe that'll be the ultimate win out of all of this. Is that teachers like you know what I was able to teach them digitally without all that paper and all those worksheets and all those packets and all that printing. I mean, it's okay to print some stuff every now and then, don't get me wrong, but man, <laughs> we gotta get it. it's out of control. Uh, speaking of out of control, folks, we are coming to the end here. Oh, wait, I rang the bell a little too early. Uh, we've got two minutes left, Adam. Let's talk about this season of season four Undisrupted. What are you looking forward to this season? What are we going to talk about? Man, we have so many... I'm excited. I was looking at our guest list that we have coming up and it's some people that I would want to talk to. I would want to talk to even if we didn't have a podcast because I say every day is something different sitting in the seat, being in a school district and being able to talk to some of the guests that we have lined up. I mean, I one of, one of our former guests had a flood in their system, uh, literally in their in their network closet. So understanding and learning how to deal with a flooding of your server closets. Mm -hmm and how you're going to move forward. Those are the things that I want to know. Those are the things I'm excited about learning about. I know tech season, leaders, tech leaders this year. they always feel like they're underwater, but literally at that point, yes, <laughs> we're trying not to drown. <laughs> uh, yeah, I am too. I mean, I think, and also this year, we're kind of doing something a little bit different because we're pulling in people that um, are working for companies, but they were former tech directors or former CTOs. Yeah. So we're going to get a perspective of them. Like what's things like on the other side? You know, I say kind of evilly the vendor side of things. Um, and so we're going to invite a couple of our friends who, of course, now are either retired or have moved on to some sort of vendor life. We're going to invite a couple of them on the show. We're going to hear from, uh, well, I don't want to give it away, but a, a pretty big person that was uh, is now in charge of a very large organization that also has a lot of letters in it um, that a lot of people go to the conference for. And he also used to work in federal government under Barack Obama. So um, just kind of giving a little teaser. Barack there, Hussein but. Obama. Barack Hussein Obama. That's right. <laughs> get it. Why do you get to throw the end in there? Yeah, every time. So I am, I, I think, I think our underlying theme though, Adam, is going to be that point that we just talked about. And that's a sustainability. And I think when we bring in these guests, yeah. we're going to start asking those questions because last year we really focused on equity. We focused on access. Before that, we even talked a little bit about the funding. What are we going to do with it when we get it? Now let's start looking long-term. What can we really do? Moonshot thinking. And I'm not talking about Elon Musk type moonshot thinking. Yeah. And, and one last piece also, we're going to talk about that, our, our own personal wellness, because that's something we always have to talk about, always have to worry about is keeping our heads on our shoulders so we can support people. You can't pour from an empty bucket. And those are those things that we want to make sure we're giving you to keep you out there undisrupted. See what that's, I did there? Right, that's right, folks. This has been Pardon the Disruption on the Undisrupted Podcast brought to you by Future Ready Schools. We thank you guys for joining us for the special episode as we kick off season four. He's Adam, and you can follow him at AskAdam3 on the Twitters. And he's Carl, and you can follow him at Mr. Hooker. And remember, everybody, we are always better together. And we are better undisrupted. Undisrupted. This podcast is made possible by the generous support of Amazon Web Services.